Hello friends, we're going to be looking at organizational culture, specifically Edgar Schein's article, What is Culture? I'm looking at the 1991 version of this in the book, Reframing Organizational Culture. Let's get into it. We're gonna start by talking about Schein's background, then the competing approaches to study culture, culture as a core concept, Schein's definition, of culture and lastly the levels of culture and that's really what this article is known for most people come away with the understanding of the three levels of culture so first shines background professor at MIT at the Sloan School of Management he's written over a dozen books and many articles on life and organizations he's very well known for his contributions to organizational culture and leadership so let's talk about the competing approaches to study and define culture First is the survey research approach. This is very common, and this approach wants to quantify and measure organizational culture, like through surveys. You fill out your bubble sheets, your circle of five or a four for various questions, and then a consultant or the person in human resources crunches the numbers and comes out with a picture of the group morale and satisfaction. And this approach is synonymous with organizational climate. He doesn't say so, but this approach is oftentimes seen as skimming the surface to organizational culture and getting at some aspects of it, but not to the deeper levels. Next is the analytical descriptive approach, and this has some similarities to the first one. It still wants to measure culture, but breaks culture down into analytical component parts. For example, it looks at rites and rituals, stories, and other symbolic manifestations of the deeper phenomena that collectively imply culture. So in other words, you have your rights, rituals, norms, etc. And that overall adds up to culture as we know it. So the idea there is if you can understand the component parts of it and get a handle on that, then you have a pretty good idea of what the culture of that organization is like, because those add up to the overall concept that we consider to be culture. Culture, though, is a big concept, and it's hard to wrap your head around. And so it's a little easier to understand it if you break it down. The third approach is the ethnographic approach, and this is the most traditional approach to studying culture, where the deeper structures of culture cannot be understood without intensive and extensive observation and interviews with key cultural insiders. So this is the approach that ethnographers take. Culture exists only as an enacted social reality of the observable behavioral manifestations of members of the culture. In other words, you can really only stand culture if you watch people live it. It's a lived social reality, not something that you can just fill out a bubble sheet and figure out with a couple of fours or fives on a survey. You have to talk to insiders, you have to get in there and live it and watch it happen. This is the approach taken by anthropologists and sociologists. It's really the traditional time-consuming approach where people go in for months, sometimes years into a community and study it from the inside. Nowadays, you actually see anthropologists and sociologists going in and studying large organizations and figuring out what their cultures are like. Let's turn now to the common conceptual themes in the article about culture. Shine talks about how culture implies stability over time. This is not something that happens in a flash. Culture is a lasting part of organizational life. Culture emphasizes conceptual shared meaning. So it's not just about the behaviors, but it's about how people think and feel and process things as a group. In other words, if you're part of this culture, you probably see things relatively the same way as others because you have a shared meaning about what things mean. Culture implies patterning. If you've ever joined a new organization and you, new, you show up at work and you don't really understand all the activity that's happening around you, it might look a little chaotic and random, but over time you learn that there's a pattern and that pattern has emerged for a reason that members of the culture understand. Culture implies dynamics. So even though it is stable over time, we're talking about human beings and interaction. And so there is change as well. This is a dynamic moving target. Culture implies all aspects of group life. Culture is not off to the side. Like you have your accounting department and your sales department, and you also have the people in human resources that worry about culture. That's not what culture is. Culture is a through and through part of everybody's experience in the group. So let's turn now to the formal definition of culture. 
that Shine offers. It's a multi-part definition. It's very lengthy, and you may want to take several passes at it. Culture is a pattern of shared basic assumptions invented, discovered, or developed by a given group as it, meaning the group, learns to cope with its problems of external adaptation and internal integration that has worked well enough to be considered valid and therefore is to be taught to new members of the group as the correct way to perceive, think, and feel in relation to those problems. Like I said, it's pretty lengthy. You may want to rewind and read it over a couple of times to internalize it. The levels of culture are really the part that most people come away with from this article remembering because it's relatively visual compared to the other aspects and it's very concrete. Shine talks about how artifacts rest upon values which rest upon underlying assumptions and that it takes a lot of time to understand the different levels of one's own organizational culture. I think it's helpful to think of this as a pyramid where the artifacts are just the tip of the iceberg, the most visible part. So the artifacts, according to Shine, are the visible organizational structures and processes. And even though they're visible, they're easy to look at and see and point to, they're very hard to decipher. So if your organization is organized in a chain of command hierarchy style versus a team organizational pattern, well, it's not easily decipherable what that means at a deeper level. You can see it. Let's say you have an assembly line. You can see it, but what does that mean at a deeper level? The meaning is not apparent, and he said you have to spend some time drilling down past these level of artifacts to understand the values that go underneath them. So underneath the tip of the iceberg, those artifacts rest upon values. And the values are the strategies, the goals, the philosophies of a culture, the espoused justification. So these are the reasons that we're doing things. This is why we're driven in a certain direction to choose certain artifacts that rest upon them takes a little time to reflect, however. So beneath the level of, let's say you have an, as an artifact, an assembly line or a chain of command hierarchy. Beneath that, you're going to be driven by a set of values that made you decide to organize things that way in the first place. And what are those values? Well, it depends. Every organization, every culture is going to be different. Maybe you think that efficiency is a primary value. And maybe you believe that there's only one right way to do thing, and that's a philosophy or a justification for those decisions. Those, by the way, are the kind that come out of the classical management era, especially Frederick Taylor. And those values have shaped a lot of organizations, and they've driven a lot of people to make decisions in a certain way. So beneath the values, we have the foundation, the underlying assumption underneath it all. And because they're underlying assumptions, they're very hard to get a handle on. You're not going to figure these out in a couple of minutes. These are the unconscious, taken-for-granted beliefs, habits of perception, thought, and feeling. These are the ultimate source of the parts of the pyramid above it, the values and those actions that we take on top of those values. Underlying assumptions are the things we don't generally talk about, and Shine said it's worth reflecting on these, and it may take some time to figure out what your underlying assumptions are. I want to give you one very isolated example to give you a taste for it. Based upon everything I've read and heard, the company called Amazon is a very difficult place to work. Whether you're at the corporate offices or in the warehouse, it's a hard place to work, and there have been many articles written about that. Part of it likely comes from the underlying assumptions that the leaders have about people, about employees. And if you listen to the CEO long enough, you're going to say, yeah, it's, he's going to say, yeah, it's a hard place to work, and look, we're going to drive you pretty hard. And you say, well, if you got him in a room alone in a more vulnerable moment, and you said, well, what do you think about people? Why is it? Why do you have to drive people so hard? He might come away with saying, well, look, people are lazy or you got to watch them or they're going to take advantage of you. I've heard many bosses say things like that when you push them on their philosophy. Now, I'm not saying he believes this. I'm not saying the CEO of Amazon believes this, but it is interesting to realize that beneath his choices for a very hard place to work are underlying assumptions that shaped his values and the artifacts in that organization. If you contrast that with Facebook, which is an amazing place to work by most accounts, high level of satisfaction, very generous maternity leave and so forth. People really want to work at Facebook. And you push the leaders on their underlying assumptions about people. In other words, what are employees like? What are people like? 
I believe that they would have a pretty favorable view of what employees are like, how workers are, because they've built on top of that values and artifacts that support a positive view of employees. Now we're only looking at one isolated example and we're speculating, but that's the idea. It takes a while to talk through this and it's hard to get a handle on it because they are underlying assumptions. But those are the three levels of culture that most people come away with and when they read these writings by Shine, the artifacts, values, and underlying assumptions. If I had to rank this article, I would say it's in the top 10, probably even top five organizational communication style articles written on culture. It's cited by just about every author that's ever written on culture recently, and for good reason. Shine delivers things in a very clear way, but he has a level of sophistication that he adds to it, even though he's incredibly clear and relatively concise uh, when it comes to writing about culture. So I highly recommend it. Thanks, and I will see you next time.